<clears throat> okay, well, welcome uh, to today's panel event. Uh, today is the second day of uh, Manchester in Translation, which is a uh, three-day celebration of uh, translation and a series of workshops and talks and, and keynote uh, uh, talks. Uh, my name is Rob Page. I'm the founder of Common Press, and today uh, we're uh, hosting a, a fascinating, hopefully a fascinating conversation uh, about uh, decolonizing translation. Uh, today's guests uh, are Kavita Barnott, uh, Catherine Bachelor, uh, and Meg Sears. Um, I'm going to have a conversation with each of them. I'll introduce them properly in a, in a moment. But if, uh, if if everybody wants to ask questions, please pop them in uh, the chat, and uh, we'll we'll pose those questions to to the speakers as we go along. Um, just to introduce uh, today's guests, uh, Kavita Arnott is a writer, editor, researcher, translator, teacher, and organizer. Uh, her fiction and non-fiction has been published widely, uh, including the influential essay, Decolonize, Not Diversify, uh, which is an essay we'll talk about a lot today. Uh, she is also the editor of three short story collections, including Too Asian, Not Asian Enough, and the book about Birmingham with Common Press, uh, along with a co-editor of Violent Phenomena, uh, 21 essays on translation. Her, uh, her translation from the Hindi of Ma is Scared by uh, Anjali Kajal uh, won a Pen Translates Award uh, and was published by um, uh, Common Press earlier this uh, last year. Catherine Bachelor is a Professor of Translation Studies and Director uh, of the Centre for Translation Studies at UCL. Uh, she is the author of Decolonizing Translation and Translation and Paratext and has co-edited six volumes of essays, including Intimate en Enemies uh, with uh, Claire uh, Bistorf, um, Translating Franz Fanon Across Continents and Languages and Translation uh, Travails. Um, Catherine's primary research interests uh, lie in translation theory, post-colonial translation, translation history, and translation philosophy. Uh, and our third guest is uh, Meg Sears, who is the direction uh, of operations and outreach for a fantastic organization called Respond Crisis Translation. Respond Crisis Translation is a coalition of language practitioners fighting to dismantle systematic language rights violations. They use translation skills uh, across the world to enable access to legal support, social services, healthcare, and other uh, human rights. Uh, Meg is based in Berlin, where she's uh, a graduate student of uh, the, uh, Middle Eastern Studies at Freie Universität and is working on research uh, at the intersection of language access, justice, asylum and resettlements. She speaks Spanish, uh, Moroccan Diraji, uh, Palestinian Arabic and is working on learning German. Uh, thank you all of you uh, uh, for coming today. I thought I'd just start by asking you to talk a little bit each uh, about your work, uh, how you got to, into it, how you got into translation because um, everyone's journey is different and everyone's journey has kind of lessons for all of us. Uh, but also to talk about what decolonizing uh, translation means uh, for you. Um, how How is translation um, colonialized in the first place? Um, uh, yeah, and, and why is it important uh, um, for you? What does it mean, uh, decolonizing translation in, in your context? So uh, shall we start with Kavita? Thank you, Ra, and thanks for inviting me to speak today. Um, so um, you just to say a little bit more about myself, thank you for um, the introduction. So I um, came to translation in a kind of literary sense quite recently. I have been thinking for many years about how translation has been a part of my work and who I am um, all my life. Um, so one of the things that I have written about is the fact that you as a second generation or third generation with family who is not English speaking while living in the West, living in the UK in my case, um, are translating from a very young age for family members. Um, and it's something you do without thinking. Um, it, it's a part of your life. I think I writing in English and often writing about Punjabi speaking characters, Punjabi speaking worlds. I also um, was very conscious and I've speaking to a lot of others as well, who I think also reflect on the same thing that in many ways you end up translating while you're writing. So there isn't a text that you're translating from, but often you're thinking um, in another language and, and translating. Um, and then I, I was 
always interested in in translating literature, particularly from Punjabi. But I think that there's a, a few different factors that that hold you back. Perhaps the idea of who a translator is, who gets to translate, the way that which you learn language. So. I grew up speaking Punjabi at home, for example, and Hindi was always around me and I spoke those languages, but I never learned them formally. So I think some of the, the issues and questions that I'm concerned with is the ways in which you internalize um, these kind of hierarchies or senses, a sense of who um, gets to be a translator or who is a translator. Um, I ended up um, having, and, and I and I started off um, being interested in particular in translating some short stories by a friend of mine uh, who I knew as I lived for some years in India. Um, she lives in Delhi. She's Punjabi speaking, but she writes in Hindi. Um, and I really wanted to translate her stories. And in a kind of very practical way, I had a mentorship um, with the National Center for Writing with Jeremy Tiang and started to not just translate, but also thinking about decolonizing translation um, in the context in which I'd already, is something I'd already been thinking about in literature um, generally, and I'd already in 2015 written this essay. So through that process of mentorship, we were having lots of the kind of conversations and thoughts that I'd already been having regarding literature like who we face, who we write for, explaining, um, simplifying. Um, I just want to slightly just stop um, and give a little caveat at the same time that although I wrote this essay in 2015, Decolonize Not Diversify, and that word at that, at that point was not kind of popular in the way it's been. There's been a kind of revival of that word. Um, at that time, it was only coming up in the context. Of course, there's many people, writers who have talked about decolonizing, especially in a literal material sense, um, in terms of land, for example. Um, but it had come up in the context of decolonize, not diversify as an alternative to diversity through campaigns such as, you know, roads must fall. Um, and then I kind of brought it into the context of literature to articulate a growing kind of radical energy that was questioning how often, you know, normal, normalized ideas of, um, you know, like white perspectives became normalized and how diversity seemed to be a, a response to that. But actually, it was often very superficial, tokenistic. It was about inclusion. So it was just about kind of widening um, uh, spaces, texts, writers um, through identity. But it didn't really go deep. It wasn't structural. It didn't really question and challenge structures of power. Um, and inserting yourself in that often left people, writers still being disenfranchised and having to fit themselves into that hierarchy. Um, it led to a lot of, and I think this is what, I, what I've what i also seen, and I think maybe we'll talk about this later, but as, what, as time has gone on and decolonize has kind of become popular and become almost um, used interchangeably with diversity, um, at the same time, what I've seen is that there's a lot of kind of commodification or fetishizing or performing um, in the name of decolonizing. So to just quickly summarize what I would say, um, in some ways, I, I wouldn't use the word decolonize today, but maybe I'd talk about what I am critiquing or interested in critiquing. It is commodification, fetishizing, and a kind of attitude of acquisition, entitlement, curiosity, saviour mentality, categorising. And these are all, these have all been aspects of um, translation. So your question about how it's colonial um, is something we talk about in Violent Phenomena in the introduction, that history of translation um, uh, as being kind of a tool in colonialism and understanding societies and defining them and um, in order to rule better or in order to, and, and sometimes that can play out in the world of literature um, there's, there's more I want to say about how I've been doing it in my own practice but I feel like I've been speaking too long so shall I just pause there yeah we'll come back to you uh, we'll come back to that that's my second question so uh, yeah thank you for uh, Meg do you want to talk Sure thing. I'm Meg. Um, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me to be here today with all of you. I'm really grateful. 
to be here. I lead operations and outreach at Respond Crisis Translation. And as Ram mentioned, we're a global collective of about 2,500 translators, interpreters, and language activists mobilizing pretty truly around the clock um, to support asylum seekers and refugees and, and really anyone in need of language support in the midst of crisis. Um, our collective provides trauma-informed language support in now over 180 languages um, and partners with more than 500 nonprofits and grassroots collectives that offer legal, um, medical, psychological, emotional education and job support. Really, the list goes on and on um, to asylum seekers and refugees. And just to give you some concrete examples of the kinds of work we do, we translate asylum applications, which can be hundreds of pages long. Um, so that folks can apply for asylum and not have their cases thrown out based on translation errors. Uh, we interpret therapy sessions for survivors of torture. We translate key legal resources for recently arrived um, refugees and immigrants. We translate medical information and interpret doctor's appointments for free medical clinics. Again, the list really goes on. We um, don't say no to the projects that come in. So beyond this, we also try to do ed education and advocacy work around language access and language justice to really bring these topics um, to the public as language access work is so often invisibilized. And through our work, um, we see colonialist attitudes really uh, in a disturbingly wide variety of ways. I think first we see um, widespread mistranslation in media or even lack of translation, which serves um, colonial and racist tropes about oppressed peoples, which I think we will hopefully dig into further uh, later on. And we also see a, a kind of surprisingly pervasive expectation that translation work can and should be done for free, um, even in indigenous and marginalized languages, even in refugee and resettlement contexts. Um, and this systemic lack of funding for language access work incentivizes organizations to use AI powered machine translation tools, which I think we uh, all know as translators are wildly inadequate in most, if not all languages. So I think in these ways, decolonizing translation in our work, um, first and foremost means prioritizing economic justice for translators and interpreters, really recognizing that translation and interpretation work requires uh, skill and expertise and, and must be justly compensated to be done well and then budgeting appropriately to be able to do so. Thank you, thank you, Meg. Um, Catherine, do you want to talk a little bit about um, your journey into, into what you do and, and also what decolonizing is for you? Thank you, thank you for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. What, what, a, lovely, what a lovely and fantastic panel. Um, yeah, I mean, my journey began sort of 20 years ago or more, I would say. Um, I had got interested in Francophone African literature, so literature written by particularly West African authors in French. Uh, I'd got quite into reading that. And then I did a master's in literary translation back in 2002. And I thought, well, I wonder how this stuff reads in English translation. Is any of it translated and how's it been done? And so I started looking at the English translations of these Francophone African works. And I discovered that, um, I think because of the pressures coming from the publishing industry, really, to have fluent texts, you know, texts that read well in English, a lot of the really innovative stuff that these Francophone authors were doing with French uh, was just completely disappearing. So that that really interests me because there was often, if not always, a kind of political dimension to what the Francophone authors were doing. I mean, I was looking at authors who were writing, uh, you know, prior to independence or around the time of independence when, you know, there are big questions over what do we do with this French language that's been, you know, sort of imposed on us? Uh, do we reject it? Do we accept it? Do we try and do our own thing with it? So all these, you know, political sort of linguistic cultural debates going on. And, you know, every author was responding to that in a different way. Um, but they were responding to it and doing something that kind of felt to me that it was crucial to notice what they were doing, whatever, however we interpreted what they were doing. Um, but in the English translations, most of the innovation, as I called it, was, was disappearing. So that kind of led me into a PhD. And then I, I wrote the decolonizing translation book sort of off the back of that. Um, and again, it was, you know, as Kavita was saying, it was kind of in a time when 
the idea of decolonizing was there. I mean, very famously, Ngugi Wationgo had written Decolonizing the Mind back in 1986. So the idea was there, but it wasn't this kind of word that everybody knew about necessarily. Um, so that's kind of how my journey began. And one of the things I really wanted to try and discuss was how do we translate in a decolonizing way? You know, it's easy to criticize what other people have done and say, you know, it's a disgrace or whatever. It's easy to do that. But then it, you come around to the question, well, how do we actually do this? Can we can we do it and how do we do it? So I think we're going to come on to talk about that in a moment. But that, that question's kind of stayed with me, really, for 20 years. Um, and I get students to think about it and they always come up with interesting points. I think my ideas about what decolonizing is have changed a bit over those 20 years as well. Um, I was very much text focused and focused in on the really the minutiae of what we do with language at that point. Whereas I think now, um, you know, particularly Kavita after, you know, reading your Violent Phenomena book, uh, we look at one of the essays in there, the one about Zong, the, the distranslation of Zong. Uh, if people know that, we look about, we look at that with our students and really there it's all about sort of the lack of respect shown to shown to authors. Um, and I think that that you know that hugely comes into it. So it's not just about these textual questions. So but I'll I'll stop there because otherwise I'll carry on for the whole hour. <laughs> thank you. Well well thank you Catherine. Let's jump straight back in, Catherine. What and uh, I'll start with you this time. What what do we do? Uh, apart from pointing out what uh, all the bad things that have been done in the past, um, how do we improve? Uh, the situation well i mean in in a way the easier one maybe is the kind of thing that i was just talking about respect for the author i think if if an author is alive uh then it's very good to di dialogue <laughs> with the author before translating their work in a way that you know you think might be best whoever you are um and i think that's that's something that you know uh, from the the, the stories that um Norbise Philippe told, you know, that that just didn't happen in her case. And, uh, you know, I think it's very shocking how, how she was how she was treated. Um, so in, in that sort of general way, I think there are answers around respect and dialogue and discussion um, rather than just kind of assuming that, you know, that the way we might want to go about it is kind of, yeah, let's just let's just do it. Um, I think when it comes down to those those detailed sort of decisions of translation, it's always that there's never going to be, right, we're never going to solve it, we're never going to say, right, this is how we do it. When I was looking at Francophone African literature, a lot of the technique the Francophone authors are using can be repl replicated in English. They can be. So where they are maybe taking, uh, say, a grammar form for, from a, a local language, from something like the Mande language, and they're sort of, you know, changing the French to reflect that, that grammar form, you can often do that in English. So you can, you, can, you can do the practical stuff. The question is how that's going to be interpreted. Because as soon as people know that it's a translated book, you know, I'm thinking of publishers, I'm thinking of reviewers, they're likely to think you're just translating badly if you have something that is a bit disruptive, a bit strange in English. Even if in your preface you say, this is what I'm trying to do, it's quite likely to get criticized by reviewers and and publishers so I think you 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 can innovate in a way that reflects what what an author is doing to try and maybe decolonize a European language you can do that but the question is whether it's going to kind of land whether it's going to be accepted and I think there's much more acceptance for original works say original works in English to disrupt English say you know work by somebody like Salman Rushdie, you know, if, that, if that's disruptive to English, it's got maybe some English that isn't, uh, you know, a sort of a RP, London English, whatever. That's generally acceptable. But as soon as you have a translation, there seems to be much less tolerance for sort of language that, that is a bit unusual, a bit different. Um, so I think, I think it's, a, it's, it's, a very, it's a very difficult question. <laughs> Sorry, Kavita, thank you. Kavita, um, what uh, what practical uh, suggestions, what practical things that uh, the translators need to be aware of to, to combat this and to fight this? 
Um, thanks, Ra. Um, I guess just picking up from um, um, what Catherine's saying, I think the really important questions, and um, and I think that for me, some of the the things that I think are needed are probably um, about a shift in how we see not just translation but literature. Um, and I, as like some of the work I've been doing around um, and something I've set up in a book I'm writing, Literature Must Fall, is about also not seeing um, like the, the, there's no kind of definitive or authority that, you know, texts should have. Um, and we should always keep that in mind. And I think part of that with translation is to also see that as a process. So um, a trans a translation is not a definitive translation. And one of the problems is this long-standing kind of assumption or understanding or impression even that's actively, you know, given that a translation is, you know, it was originally lit written in that language rather than just a subjective translation. And my thoughts are that this thing about translation on the cover, which is um, really important, not just for crediting the translator, but also in terms of making that positionality and perspective clear and and how we, we do just even kind of, you know, have spaces to read translation critically. And we don't put so much of a burden on translators because there's no kind of right or wrong. Um, and then um, I think in other ways, um, not perhaps also um, also thinking about interrogation. So I think for translators to think that, you know, again, not to carry such a burden, but just be committed to that self-interrogation um, if they are from a different context or, you know, their life experience is different or positionality and to, to think about um, constantly um, interrogating the assumptions and being open to learning. Um, and part of that is the dialogue with the writer that um, Catherine mentioned. Um, but other parts are just, you know, work that we all just have to be doing um, ongoing. Um, apart from that, I also think that the commitment to understanding the kind of specificity and layers and hierarchies of any language, region, people, um, because I think one of the problems that, that comes with diversity in general, including translation, is this kind of perhaps too much of a burden of representation um, or, or a sense that, you know, somebody is... Um, even if they're not from that background, they, they know that they kind of represent um, that that perspective. Um, so constantly being aware of like every space, is, every region, area is so complex and nuanced and specific. Um, and and I, that goes for readers as well and how books are presented. So they're not about learning about a place or people or, you know, one of the things I brought up in my essay, Decolonize Not Diversify, was that language of people talking about literature um, as kind of almost like medicine, I think the word I use, but it's good for you. Um, and, you know, that we're doing something very noble by reading about, you know, people and places. Um Another aspect of this, which I've been particularly interested in, is also not the kind of hierarchy of importance that's given to text on the page and to literature on the page. Um, and I think um, a lot of the work that you know Meg's talking about as well is kind of, and, and I'm really glad that you know this conversation has opened up to see translation in this larger sense and not kind of, in a way, giving so much importance to literature, but but translation in a larger sense, but also the kind of, you know, importance in, you know, material situations. In the end, people's lives are always more valuable and important than literature, in my opinion. Um, um, and an extension of that for me is also um, um, obviously not because it's not like the kind of, you know, crisis situations um, that we're talking about, but in terms of thinking about diaspora and thinking about the history of colonialism and the fact that a lot of people have lost language, whether um, it's in um, their home countries or being in the diaspora, second, third generation. Um, and despite the kind of history of colonialism and translation, that connection, at the same time, it's also that reality that many people have lost languages. And sometimes all you have is um, 
oh, in a, a colonial language like English. Um, and in that situation, translation becomes really valuable. Um, so I, I've been really interested in how we can engage with, for example, uh, Punjabi literature here in the UK, um, especially amongst those, you know, especially young people, for example, who really want to connect and don't always have access or the language skills to be able to read, understand. But I've also been really interested in how we do that, not, not necessarily through the Pana page, but in person. Um, so I've been organizing something called Jag, Punjabi and Bahari Patwari, Language and Literature Festival. We have a reading group. Um, and in many ways, that's all around translation because it's about coming together and, you know, reading through or listening to things or and discussing them and everybody bringing lived life. So even one word, you know, everybody's kind of brought something from their lived life and little pieces into a shared space. With our reading group, we read poetry, we read literature, and everybody of different ages, experiences, um, generations is kind of, in a way, bringing their little, little bits together. So we all kind of, are, it's about communal kind of understanding. And I think that's also important because it's facing inward in a way. There's nothing kind of performative about that. It's like nobody's gaining anything except that we're all understanding ourselves, our histories, the literature, the language for ourselves, just for ourselves. Um, and so that's, I think, um, some of the ways, as well as, of course, in terms of translation on the page, thinking about lots of questions um, like who we are translating for, who we face. Um, so I think working on the translation of My Scared, the short stories that Kama um, published and including working with Ra, I think we had lots of interesting conversations and, you know, it was, it was great that there was a kind of openness to to thinking through some, of, some questions such as, um, you know, what we translate and what we leave in. I know that Catherine um, was talking about the difficulty of that, but I do think things are changing. And I do think that there is, there is, of course, some response, you know, and, and I know even with that translation I did, there's a sense that it's too literal. Um, and I'm myself not sure how much of this is perhaps people's expectations or perhaps um, uh me being so respectful that, you know, I was kind of um, just aware sometimes that I don't want to, you know, do too much to change, um, but also keeping in a lot of words that I just thought I can't translate them. So we'll leave them in, but not having them in italics. Um, so they're not, they're not othered, um, not having a glossary. So there's no set kind of sense of explaining. There were often words that were in English, but it was an Indian English. So we would have conversations about how to just leave those in. An example I can think of, I don't know if you remember, Ra, is um, cycle. And I remember us talking about cycle in, it's a very specific word for a bicycle, um, but it wouldn't be a bicycle. And you wouldn't say bike because that means motorbike. And so just a very small example. Or the word busti, which is an area where people live. In early translations, I had translated it as slum. And then not just my own thinking, but also the author as well, not feeling comfortable with that word, obviously because of the negative associations and actually it isn't a slum, but there's no translation for that word. And we just kept it in. And I generally think that people do just um, pick up, they do um, just you know guess what, what the meaning of a word is. But also the fact that actually people from you know other parts of the world have always read in English and not known what everything means or what it refers to, and been okay and just you know got through means that we just have to stop, kind of trying to make literature palatable for, um, uh, for example, the white middle class reader and Anton Ha who did the keynote speech really writes about that in his essay in Violent Phenomena and um, not centering that reader. Um, yeah. Thank you. There's there's loads more to, to dig into that, but um, I thought I'd just uh, take what you're saying about the importance of the the real world uh, and uh, translation in the real world, uh, and ask Meg just to uh, explain a little bit more about this idea of language justice. So, um, 
I think there is a, a lot of people going to translation with a passion for, for you know, greater understand, understanding and, um, and kind of a certain, uh, you might even say activist kind of zeal, but that's, that's, uh, that's never more so than in, uh, as far as I can see, than in, in your organisation. Do you, do you feel uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a, um, a, an activist uh, passion or a zeal which brings your volunteers and your members uh, into the organisation, and can you talk a little bit more about what you mean by language justice? That's a really interesting question. Yeah, I think that, um, I guess first to speak to the activist zeal part, I think that our network is um, 2,500 translators strong. And so folks come to this work from a really wide variety of places. And we do, I think, see that that there's certainly some activist zeal um, among particularly privileged multilingual folks who want to put their language skills to work doing something of use for other people. And then there's also perhaps the majority of our network is, is folks um, like Kavita mentioned who've grown up translating for their families or who themselves have been refugees, asylees, um, deportees, and have really experienced the pervasive and violent nature of language barriers who themselves have experienced the weaponization of language and immigration and resettlement processes and so want to um, pitch in to try to dismantle these systemic language barriers. And I guess in that same vein, language justice um, is a broad term that perhaps means different things to different people, but we use it first and foremost to mean language access that all people, regardless of the language or dialect or variant uh, that they speak should be able to access key resources and services and support in their native language. Um, and we work particularly in crisis contexts and high stakes asylum and detention and deportation contexts, medical and psychological emergencies in which lack of access to high quality translation that's trauma informed and dialectically matched can literally mean the difference between life and death. When someone's asylum application is thrown out because of um, a pronoun mistranslation, an I that is translated as a we that uh, renders an inconsistency in their asylum application. Their asylum application is thrown out and then they're deported um, and, and perhaps face death. So the language access piece perhaps is the first element. Um, and the second piece of our work, I would say again, is, is economic justice in that to make this language access a reality requires access to training and professionalization and just pay for language access practitioners. Um, and as you probably all already know, formal education programs, formal training in translation and interpretation literally just does not exist in, in most non-colonial languages, particularly in indigenous and African languages. There is no training or professionalization that folks can access to become um, translators and interpreters. And then beyond this, as I've alluded to, um, translation and interpretation remains systemically invisibilized and underfunded. Um, even in these contexts in which we work in refugee and resettlement contexts, in which there is no way, there's literally no way for these large aid organizations to serve the populations they seek to without the support of skilled and qualified translators, we continue to see um, an across the board claim to a lack of funding to pay for language access work um, and the expectation again that translators should volunteer their time. And as, as is increasingly more pervasive these days, the expectation that AI powered machine translation tools um, will provide adequate translations that can then just be proofread. And again, this is an economic justice issue as proofreading is paid at about one third of the rates of translation. And yet in most languages, AI powered machine translation tools truly are just producing mingled nonsense. And so it would in fact be much easier for translators to just translate the documents rather than proofread them. Um, so one piece of what we're trying to do is build out a training infrastructure to provide talented multilingual people, um, many of whom are themselves refugees or asylees or deportees with access to training and professionalization and translation and interpretation. And then we also have really prioritized paying all translators in our network who have flagged that they're unable to support this work for free, um, regardless of whether or not the organization we're working with on the project is paying us which has put us in a um, financially really tricky position, but is, is us trying to really embody the value of economic justice. And then I think the final piece of language justice in our work is about 
justice and reparations for survivors of language rights violations. And what I mean when I say language rights violations um, are instances in immigration court, for example, where there are no standards or qualifications required for court interpreters. And we've literally heard horror stories of, of immigration court interpreters rifling through dictionaries in the middle of an asylum court proceeding to look for the right word. Um, additionally, asylum seekers are too often forced to use machine translation tools to translate their asylum applications, which I've said results in cases being thrown out. So in these situations where folks face deportation orders because of their cases being thrown out based on linguistic technicalities, um, we provide expert testimonies to be used in court identifying the mistranslation, which are then used to repeal deportation orders. And then beyond asylum and immigration court, we also see language rights violations in crisis contexts where translation is weaponized to deny vulnerable people access to life-saving life resources. And one example of this was last year's earthquake in Turkey and Syria, where the Turkish government following the earthquake translated key emergency resources into seven different languages, but not into Kurdish, um, despite the fact that the earthquake took place in a predominantly Kurdish speaking region of both Turkey and Syria. So in response to this, we first translated these emergency resources into a variety of dialects of Kurdish. And then we also began working on a longer term storytelling project about the history and current realities of, of language violence, of the systemic language violence throughout Kurdistan, um, which we've actually just published. So I'll try and drop in the chat in case folks are interested. Thank you, and we'll, um, we'll post it for a second. Um, absolutely amazing work. And we'll also get you to um, um, advertise links and, and where people can go to uh, at the end of this uh, to, uh, to, to join and to volunteer and to be part of the, the whole project. Um, I I kind of want to go back, uh, Kavita, to where this this whole conversation from our from our from our point of view, from Commerce's point of view, started, which was, as I say, this essay, a uh, 2015 essay, uh, uh, um, decolonize, not diversify. Um, in it, you explored kind of lingering uh, racism and implicit white supremacy in the way we increasingly uh, kind of talk about these issues through the word diversity rather than other words like uh, colonialism and racism, et cetera. Um, you kind of explored, uh, you asked the question, um, diverse from what and diverse for whom, uh, and the implicit sort of privilege, privileging of, of white readers in a lot of the campaigning and language uh, around uh, diversity. But the most interesting point for me that you made in that essay was the fact that it's, it's kind of, you say it's conciliatory and ahistorical. And I think that ahistorical uh, aspect to it uh, is really, really uh, interesting because it's it's celebratory, um, it's upbeat, it's positive. It's uh, saying there are no, you know, let's let's include everybody, and and therefore suddenly everything's okay again. Um, but it's also uh, removing and, and implicitly, or, it, or you argue that it's it's implicitly removing uh, the history from which we can we can learn a lot uh, uh, from the dynamics at play. Um, and I just wondered. Uh, how you view that essay now in in 2024, uh, nine nine years later, has have things improved? You say that the the use of the word uh, decolonization is is much more prevalent, uh, but have have things improved or have things stayed the same or got worse? Thanks, Ra. Um, yeah, I um, I wrote that essay in. It was. I feel like it was a kind of key moment around that time, two thousand and fifteen, when, um, until then, what I had been seeing for some years is a lot of resistance, um, and you could say at the margins, perhaps because I think there was a sense of kind of ignoring the kind of growing resistance that extended into literature, um, and then since then, definitely there has been a change. But in some ways, I feel like. It's in the way of cycle, the cycles that we've seen in the past as well. So I am slightly wary of the change as well, because I think we saw something similar in the 80s where there was a lot of resistance. And then we kind of had waves after that um, in, for example, the 90s and um, I and, and even the 2000s. And I'm a product of that generation, which was very apolitical. And it kind of went from a kind of, 
conciliatory kind of, you know, giving opportunities and space to kind of veering towards assimilation. So I'm kind of just a little bit kind of, you know, cautious about us thinking that, you know, everything um, has has changed be, um, since then, because I think that um, it's very possible that that's the kind of direction that we'll go in. But also the familiar part of it is that um, I think there can be, as I've said already, a lot of like fetishizing or performative um, uh, kind of politics that centers identity and in some ways not actually looking, going in deep into um, the kind of layers of what is being produced, um, what is published, what is given space, but it feels like a lot has kind of opened up. Um, so the word decolonize, in a way, I feel like maybe it, it was appropriated, um, but I think words are very easy to appropriate. So in some ways that's not surprising and it is used today interchangeably with diversity I don't think we particularly um, understand it as, as something different from diversity which as I've already said is about inclusion um, and it's about as you said as well Ra from the article um, it's about kind of seeming like the present is inclusive because it appears inclusive um, and not looking at the history. So, for example, a lot of the kind of idea of from empire to multiculturalism, and it's almost as if and diversity follows on from multiculturalism, but it's the kind of sense that now, because of that history, um, so it's even seen in a positive way, you know, we are this kind of multicultural or diverse society. And another note aspect of it that I also want to highlight is the centering of literature, which I find um, is really interesting because I think that a lot of the struggles have been very material struggles um, and, and, and that's continuing today, obviously, what's happening with Palestine. And I think that it, there's something a bit absurd to emphasise literature so much. Um, and, and in some ways it feels like it's about um, appearing to, you know, the thing, the appearance of things have changed because you're publishing so many books. And of course, it's only, you know, some people that are able to write books or some people that are able to, um, you know, have the kind of resources in order to read, publish and be part of that kind of structure. But it's almost presented as a solution um, and becomes kind of dominant um, so I so I do think that's an aspect of you know what that kind of response has been to decolonizing being um and, and universities as well. Perhaps there's 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 too much importance given to these spaces, which ultimately are privileged spaces um as a as a solution to to um yeah, real real material issues. Thank you. Um, I'm kind of uh, what you're saying about the word, the, these words, which are then are kind of assimilated, as you say, and uh, kind of neutralized and, and denuded of their, their history, especially, you know, if the word decolonized could be assimilated, it, it kind of makes me think of this, the situationist idea of recuperation, you know, taking once radical ideas and, and assimilating them and kind of um, accommodating them and softening them and repackaging them. And is uh, and becoming ultimately, as you say, kind of performative, um, and a little bit kind of contentless and a little bit empty and hollow. Um, and um, I was going to ask Catherine uh, a question about Fanon uh, because you wrote a, a, a collection of essays, or you edited a collection of essays about, or contributed to a collection of essays about uh, the dis dissemination of uh, Francis Fanon and uh, uh, Fanon's book, uh, The Wretched of the Earth, which is perhaps like, along with Said uh, and Orientalism, it's like one of the key, key archetypal texts in kind of anti-colonialist thinking. Um, did you find, uh, or have you found, Catherine, that in the, in the way in which uh, Fanon was, uh, his incredibly radical ideas and controversial ideas were incorporated or translated and transmitted into the West, were they, were they softened? Are they are there softened versions of Fanon out there that have been recuperated and kind of lost their, a little bit of their original meaning? Or do we underplay uh, the kind of 
latent radicalism in the in the target languages yeah i mean fanon is a really interesting case because obviously you know um he was a major anti-colonial figure and then he was a major post-colonial figure and now he's very much a decolonial figure in terms of you know the sort of theoretical different theoretical paradigms i mean when we uh, the book that we were working on we were actually really interested in the period of the 1960s and 70s so we were really interested in the first translations of fanon that that came out and we ended up focusing quite a lot as you've said on the wretched of the earth and actually we found that in those periods fanon was if anything made in a way more more radical in the sense that people translators and those who were receiving him and interpreting him for, for their audiences, they were really trying to relate what Fanon was saying about Algeria to their situation. So they were really trying to take what Fanon was saying and say, and they were saying, okay, this is really important for us. So in a way they were making what he was saying kind of more, more general and more specific. They were sort of saying, okay, we can take these ideas, but also we can, we can make this Fanon, you know, for example, uh, Ali Shariati in Iran, you know, we can actually use some uh, Islamic terminology here, which will kind of make what Fanon is saying more relevant to our current situation, right? Um, and I found that sometimes this was probably very, very conscious, and sometimes it was maybe a little bit unconscious. So if I was looking at uh, Constance Farrington's English translation of The Wretched of the Earth, and there are several places where her voice makes Fanon's words kind of echo with uh, the history of Ireland, uh, the history of Italy. So these, these kind of words that she's choosing, things like risings, things like uh, troubles, and not necessarily the words you would choose to translate the French words. So very much, and, and she was very conscious uh, as an Irish person of the kind of, and, and as a historian, the sort of history of imperialism around the world and trying to you know, make what Fanon was saying kind of echo with those other situations. But in terms of the sort of recuperation, I think that I would see that as kind of linked to, in a way, or just a more general process of simplification when you have a whole book, you know, or a whole series of books by somebody like Fanon, who's reading Sartre, who's actually, you know, also a psychiatrist, you know, he's he's really quite an intellectual figure. And a lot of what he's writing it's quite difficult, some of it, to, to grasp theoretically. But of course, when people start kind of absorbing Fanon en masse, you get his ideas simplified. That's that's just what happens. So it's kind of interesting how they're simplified. Some in some situations they become he becomes more radical. And in some, he becomes less. But it's it's kind of in a way, it's the same process. It just depends what people are in a way using Fanon for right um so in the in that early period for example in Constance Franklin's translation his Fanon's analyses of violence and the place that violence has are actually theoretically very sophisticated and they're very closely linked to what Sartre uh, said about violence in his completely unreadable critique uh, of uh, dialectical reason um, so it's quite it's quite a complex argument, but it really gets simplified down by some of Farrington's translation choices and then of course, that all gets repeated. Um, so some of his ideas about violence are not really Fanon's ideas about violence. It's this kind of simplified version, right? But then in the kind of post-colonial era of Fanon, you get kind of the opposite process where he becomes even more abstract and sort of tied up with this very, very sort of dense theoretical vocabulary. Um, so it's, it's yeah, it's, it's not sort of a one size fits all, but very much, very much shows how translations do things they change things inevitably and it's just a question of looking at well what are they changing in that in that particular moment and it's interesting how you uh, you historicize that reception a little bit as well because um different eras need different things from from great thinkers and Absolutely. Fanon, Fanon seems so relevant right now I mean the the, the bits that are heavily simplified Fanon that I, that have reached me are things like his approach to uh, what he calls European values and the the completely uh, hollow, not just the not just the fact that the European values or the values of the Enlightenment are, uh, are hypocritical and hollow and don't mean anything in the application of real European values when Europe goes out and colonizes the world, but also the way in which he quotes European values 
are weaponized as a way to kind of dehumanize uh, mm. the other and the colonized. Mm. So the virtue of European thought, you know, the greatest thinkers of the of the Enlightenment are used as weapons mm. against uh, the other. So, um, and that is that is moral performance, isn't it? It's performative morality right there, mm. uh, which is which is the situation we seem to be in uh, <laughs> right now in many many ways. Um, I'm going to ask Meg because uh, we're we're running out of time. We've got a couple of questions, but I, I need to ask Meg uh, to talk about uh, some of the less subtle ways in which translation uh, can be a colonialist act. Uh, we've been talking about some some subtle uh, colonialist uh, kind of influences, but um, sometimes it's it's blunt and it shows its teeth, and it couldn't be more obvious. Uh, Meg, your organisation um, uh, resist uh, crisis translation. Uh, Respond Crisis Translation um, was involved in an absolutely uh, staggering exposure of uh, mis mistranslation of uh, a Palestinian ho uh, hostage release from detention in the West Bank uh, back in November. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. Yes, thank you. I'll try to be brief. On November 25th, the BBC posted a clip um, with an interview of a released Palestinian prisoner, and she was describing um, the abuses she endured inside an Israeli prison. And she said in Arabic that Israel had held them in the cold without electricity, sprayed them with pepper spray and left them to die. And so this is a video. She, this is what she's saying in Arabic and the subtitles in English across the bottom of the video. The translation says, um, no one helped us. Only Hamas cared. We love them very much. And yet Hamas was not even mentioned in the original Arabic. Um, so our Arabic team lead was just casually watching the BBC and saw this interview um, and flagged it and did a, a, a corrected translation, which we then posted about on Twitter. And it got enough um, attention that the BBC ultimately corrected this translation. But it's it was quite a stunning mistranslation. And you see that um, translation can really just completely obscure what is actually being said by people and contribute to these um these racist narratives that paint entire people as as um, terrorists, and it had uh, yeah it had a huge impact in terms of its its reach on social media. And uh, we and this is how kind of one of the reasons one of the ways in which we got in contact with you because we're obviously working with a lot of Palestinian writers. Um, and you wrote a very interesting uh, blog for Comma about the way that other examples of specific Arabic words. Are either mistranslated or or not translated at all, precisely for that same effect to other and to uh, kind of create a sense of extremism in Islamic and Arabic uh, culture. Yeah, yeah, we focused in that blog on three words in Arabic. The first being shahid, um, which in English it is often translated to martyr and yet a martyr in english is someone who is killed because of their religious beliefs and a shahid in arabic has a much broader meaning it comes from the root shahada which means to see or to bear witness to um a witness for example in a court case is called a shahid um and yet being a shahid is someone who bears ultimate witness someone whose sole function now is to bear witness um but when English speakers read the word martyr, it, it brings up an entirely different image of what um, is being talked about than what is meant by the word shahid. And similarly, jihad uh, is not even translated in English. We just grab that word and use it um, and, and take it to mean holy war generally, when again, in the original Arabic, it comes from the root jihada, meaning to strive or to struggle. And in Islamic terminology, it specifically refers towards an endeavor, toward a noble cause. Um, and there are three main forms of jihad in Islamic teachings, all of which seek to establish and promote peace in society. And again, we just, with the no translation of the word jihad, have a totally different idea of what's being talked about that's quite um, dehumanizing and again, paints a whole people as terrorists. And the final word we wrote about was intifada, which again is rarely translated. We just use the word intifada in English. Um, and we've, we specifically referenced these two intifadas in Palestine, the first intifada between 87 and 93, which was a mass peaceful uprising of Palestinians beginning to organize the BDS boycott, divest and sanction movement. Um, 
really beginning to organize en masse in peaceful ways. And then the second intifada between 2000 and 2003, another mass uprising of Palestinians against the violence of military occupation. And yet um, in Western media, in the Western imagination, um, intifada really became uh, tied instead to suicide bombs and terrorist tactics. And that's still how we interpret that word when really what it means is rising up against oppression, rising up against violent, oppressive military occupation. And it, it comes, I think it comes from the, a word meaning shiver. It's what a dog, a dog does when it has too many fleas. It shivers. Um, the word is further. Um, thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Meg. Um, there's been one question and uh, we are kind of short on time, but it's, it's such a fascinating conversation. There's been a question about AI. AI has been, uh, been mentioned a few times, AI translation, machine translating. Um, and um, the, the the viewer asks, you know, is it a tool of, uh, could it be used as a tool of decolonizing uh, translation in the future? Or are you, uh, because of its mistakes and its inadequacies, are you more worried about it being a tool of, of the, you know, continuation of existing uh, barriers and and hostilities. Well, I'd like really to hear what both Catherine and Kivita have to say about that. I guess in in our context, it's hard for me to imagine AI machine translation tools being used to decolonize and diversify, specifically because of how AI algorithms function, and which is quite simply that they they read. Um, published content off of the internet and the internet is is predominantly in English about like 55% of the English of internet content excuse me is in the English language and the second most prevalent language Chinese is about 5.5% of the internet um so first there's just not a lot of text samples that that go into powering these algorithms and then second language is just it's living you know it's evolving um and AI really cannot when being fueled by these these published text pieces cannot take into account tonal variations in spoken languages, um, dialects, the mixing of indigenous languages with um, with the languages of the colonizers. It's it's yeah, hard to imagine how AI could become sensitive enough to cultural context, to linguistic evolution to really represent the languages that people really speak even in quote unquote, highly resourced languages in the AI world. Yeah, absolutely agree with you, Megan. I think as well um, in <clears throat> sensitive situations, which you're dealing with <clears throat> trust and having humans, uh, you know, hu humans you can trust professional, uh, you know, in a professional role, doing their job well and professionally and respectfully care of, you or respecting you if you're in a difficult situation that that actual the, the humanity there is 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 really important much more than just the translation of whatever sorry my internet connection is unstable so i'm going to stop um i think um thank, thank you thank you Catherine. Sorry. Shall, shall i respond or not so yes, please. If anybody's internet is, is unstable, you can always uh, turn your video off. It may make it slightly better. Um, I was going to just say that um, I, while I agree with what's been said, I'm also thinking that we could. Are there ways in which we could think of the, you know, the the opportunities or you know anything that can come? Because partly through the understanding that is, this is the future. Of course, as um, has been expressed, AI, the internet is racialized just as the world is. So, I mean, there's definitely, and maybe there's more of a kind of illusion of neutrality when it comes to, um, you know, internet um, or AI um, translation, um, which is simply not true. But at the same time, I also think that humans are also flawed and have positionality and perspectives and their subjectivity. Um, so I'm just thinking, is there something kind of productive that can come from maybe, um, you know, not to kind of, you know, see how AI can be part of the process of us seeing translation as subjective and flawed and something that, you know, is in process that we we work with and we question and and more than anything, I feel like 
we need all of us to be more critical readers, um, whether it's tr translation by humans or translation um, um, from from AI um, through that self interrogation. So, uh, the example that um, Meg gave, I guess that um, it, it, anybody who knows that you know translation plays these roles, it's it's in some ways disturbing but not surprising as well that. Um, an example like that. Thank, thank you, Kavita. There's been a quick question for you, Catherine. You mentioned uh, uh, how disruptive English sometimes comes across as bad translation. Uh, um, one of our readers writes, um, uh, as an emerging uh, translator, uh, translator uh, translating out of my own native tongue, um, I wonder what you would see uh, as practicalities for uh, quotes bad translation to help them land better. Um, does it eventually come down to whether or not the translator uh, has an established name or not, or are there are there kind of tactics that translators uh, can use to to, uh, to to help these these uh, unconventional disruptive uh, passages land better in English? So my cynical view would be, yes, pretend it's not a translation and pretend you're a very famous author and then you'll be absolutely fine. Um, but um, less cynically, I don't know. I mean, I I feel like I might be, I hope I'm slightly out of date because obviously my book was written, you know, it came out in 2009 and I had, you know, I could count, I studied sort of 72 novels, translations, and I could count on one hand the number that tried to do anything kind of experimental and of those, they pretty much all were badly criticised. So um, I don't know, maybe things are better now. There's certainly more, there are more publishers publishing translations and there are, you know, there's, there's a lot more openness to um, things that are in a little bit, bit uh, disruptive maybe. But I, 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 I always think as a translator, you're gonna be, you're gonna be just struggling because of the view of translation that it's kind of intrinsically, you know, problematic with sort of popular view of translation and you know it should really just not be recognized if it's if it's done well it should be invisible and all of these kind of ideas which are still very very current so I think you're always going to be kind of lay, laying yourself open to criticism if you if you don't produce a fluent translation um, you can certainly try you know sympathetic publisher a space for your own uh, preface or, or something and maybe just I don't know, maybe not laying it on too thick, maybe being a bit selective in, in how you how you innovate. So it's still a relatively, relatively easy reading experience. Um, but there's kind of the ideal and there's sort of like, you know, let's, you know, what Kavita's saying, let's, let's, let's do this, let's have sort of critical readers and informed readers and so on. Um, but then, yeah, there's the kind of the the practicalities of can you get it published? Can you get positive reviews, you know? Uh, these kind of things. So I don't know. I'm probably quite a pessimist generally as well. So, <laughs> um, thank you. Well, um, it's a it's a very pessimistic time that we're living in right now. Um, I'm afraid we've there's so many other questions, and there's been other questions in the chats, uh, but we've we've run out. Of So we've run out of time and I, a fire alarm is also going off in the background. Uh, so uh, please uh, just join me in uh, thanking uh, our three speakers today, uh, Catherine Batchelor, uh, Meg uh, Sears and Kavita Barnott uh, for a really, really fascinating talk. And also uh, please tune in uh, to tomorrow at 11 o'clock at the same time. Uh, there will be another uh, panel discussion of uh, working with uh, working with an author as a translator. And obviously, we've got the, the workshops going on today and tomorrow. Uh, but uh, uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for today's fascinating uh, conversation. We could go on for some time, and hopefully, we'll have you back again uh, soon. Cheers. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much.